everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Nenberg and I'm the director of SASNET, the Swedish South Asian Studies Network. Uh, we are very happy to have this lecture today together with the Swallows and to have Dr. Sabu George here who is from Kerala. Um, and um, I will not introduce you very uh, I will give the words to, to uh, the Swallows, Cecilia, but soon we will introduce you. Um, and um, for those of you who do not know what SASNET is, we will give you a small brochure um, after the lecture. And um, you are very welcome always to our open uh, lectures. Now we will we'll give the word to Cecilia at the Swallows. Please introduce the Swallows and Dr. Sam George. Thank you very much. Um, as Anna said, we're the Swallows in India, Bangladesh, or Swallow in India, Bangladesh in Swedish. Uh, we're an NGO, we're based here in Lund, and as the name tells, we're working in India and Bangladesh, supporting partner organizations to work with rights in different ways, um, in terms of working with Dalit women's rights, in terms of working with uh, forest rights, so the rights of marginalized and small scale farmers. And if you want some more information on what we're doing, uh, there's some information back. You can check that out after the, the lecture with Dr. Sabah George. And also if you want to support the work that we do, we also brought a few calendars that are actually for sale. And it's got a uh, gender theme, actually. It's women on scooters, which is the... <laughs> exactly, you can show it there. Um, yeah, so you can check that out after the lecture. But let's get on to what we're here to, to, to listen to and to talk about, which is uh, sex selective abortions. And this is why we have Dr. Saba George here, who has been working on uh, girl child issues, um, on preschool child nutrition, female infanticide, girl child neglect, and sun preference, and also sex selection. Uh, so there's a long experience in working on these issues, and I'll let you introduce your background a bit more. So very welcome to have, or very happy to have you here. I'm very welcome to all of you who are listening. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank the SASNet for calling me here, particularly Professor Anna. Uh, yesterday I was in Copenhagen and uh, the university was very, very uh, uh, jealous of the fact that SASNet is here. We don't, I mean, they don't seem to have any South Asia there in Copenhagen. So to that extent, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. I'm very grateful for Swallows for joining us and uh, making it a very different uh, um, experience. I also have the privilege of having two of my Swedish friends, uh, uh, Sarita and uh, Soma. So they are familiar with the practice of sex selection in the uh, Scandinavian community of Indians. So, but I am not familiar. I've only read pieces and from met researchers from Norway, read uh, reviews, I mean articles on. So I really do not know that part of Sweden. I mean Scandinavia, but. Uh, they are quite good and grateful that they have, they have come all the way from as far as northern Sweden today. Thank you. And uh, see, my talk will be entirely from the net. So we are very privileged uh, over the years. Like if, if I was talking, say, 12, 13 years ago, we wouldn't have had all these sources. So we have a tremendous amount of sources of information, of, of, of numbers of what is happening in India on the net. What we are failing to do is to do much about it. So uh, that's a paradox. Uh, so these are some of the sources. This is a form uh, which has been put up by an organization called Ready. They have some of the best uh, uh, internet mapping software, very high degree of compressibility. So uh, they did this for the census 2001 and 2011. They put up a separate site. So. You know, it gives us an incredible amount of information, and you, you know, the UNFP site in India is another source of information for us.
2011 child sex ratios um, from 0 to 6 years old. So you see a huge divergence. Uh, we have areas which are like Northwest India, Punjab, Haryana, which are the worst because technology started being misused right from the 70s there. And uh, you have uh, the dark green ones would be like Scandinavia. But as you see, there are very little part of India which is remaining unaffected. And uh, uh, 2001, we've seen Northwest India being the worst. 2011, we've seen Kashmir drop. We've seen rest of India like Gujarat, Maharashtra having very steep falls. And uh, for the first time, in, uh, we've seen even in Kerala at the sub-district level. So uh, I would begin by just giving you a short uh, description of uh, what is happening. Uh, I can go to the census site, but I would prefer to go to this site where the, you can actually see the JIS. You can see 2001, 2011. So what you're seeing, you know, I'm looking at a cutoff of 900. So 900 means 5% of the girls are missing by the age of 7 years. So what you're seeing is, uh, you know, Northwest India, Gujarat being worse off in uh, in uh, 2001, and uh, what you're seeing in 2011, you're seeing more parts of India which are become you know, much worse. Now, one could look at urban rural because that gives you a different picture. Um, like when you see urban India, you see a very, very sharp increase because urban India is where the facilities are, where the doctors are, and where the people have the access to the technology. Now, what has happened? I, 30 years ago, I started working in the field and I had learned nutrition because we were very concerned about malnutrition of girls and I had come across infanticide in the villages in Tamil Nadu in 86 and uh, you know initial work was all on infanticide and neglect but but in the last 15 years what's been happening is that uh, uh, sex selection this prenatal sex selection has become the most dominant cause for missing girls in India so Technology has made a tremendous difference, and uh, you know, as a society, as a culture, in, you know, we have had discrimination for hundreds of years, probably a little longer than that, but we have never seen ratios as low as today. And uh, so, the, though there are other aspects which we need to look at, other than culture, we need to look at the the involvement of medical professionals. We look to look at the. Uh, the involvement of technology companies also. Uh, 1970 was when the sex selection was introduced into the country. Abortion was legalized in 1971, medical termination of pregnancy. Now, this was the time when both UK, UK for instance, had an abortion bill in 68, Canada had it a little later, uh, Roe versus Wade in the US was 71. So. But remember, in these countries, it was out of concern for women's rights that abortion was legalized. In our country, if you look at the parliamentary debate, it's entirely because the government wanted to use it as a method of population control. There was a tremendous uh, uh, pressure from the global uh, donors. 1970 Population Council, New York sent a doctor to uh, All India Instrumental Sciences, the premier institution. So, uh, because they wanted to use sex selection as a population control. Mm -hmm. By 50s and 60s, uh, demographers were very clear about the practice of uh, family building in India. Families had children till they had the right number of sons. So even in the 80s when I was working in South India, people used to have 9 to 10 children or a lot more to have one or two boys. So you would have large families having a huge number of girls, small families having less number, having a smaller number of girls. So you would never find, even in northern India, people would have nine to ten sons, never. You would have four to five sons at the most. So what, what so the demographers felt, the population lobby felt, if you could have a method which could determine sex and then eliminate the girls, you know, the population would come down very quickly. So in the West these genetic methods, amniocentesis, chorionic villus biopsy, were introduced because uh, they wanted to uh, prevent sex linked diseases, which only affected the boys, the women, their carriers. But in our context, you know, the 
This was sold as a great service to the humanity and to the country. You know, you know, people need not keep on producing to have the right number of sons. Uh, eliminating girls was seen as unnecessary fecundity. So that was the origin. By 78, it was banned in government institutions. Then it spread to the uh, private sector. Private sector saw it as a gold mine. And uh, so now, when you look at India in a very in different parts of India, the what you are seeing is only a matter of life. That is, depending on when sex determination started being misused, you saw ratios coming down. For instance, 10 years ago, in the National Family Health Survey, NFHS 3, 2005-06, Kerala had the highest use of ultrasound for antenatal care. But there was very little misuse. But in the last uh, few years, we have seen sex selection happening, even in Kerala. Over the last 100 years, we had probably one of the best ratios in the country. But we are seeing Eastern India, Southern India, everywhere, Kashmir Valley, the most liberal places where women's status was among the better, we have seen this growth everywhere. Now, there, is, there are claims that things are getting improving now. I'm not so sure. Uh, and we, I could come into these debates a little later. But, you know, what we are dealing with is a genocide. You know, very, very severe discrimination against women. In the last hundred years, overall ratios of women in the population, overall ratios started improving. Um, but in the last 30, 40 years, we are seeing elimination before birth. And that is what is very, very frightening. And uh, because traditional forms of neglect, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, in, infanticide was anyway very rare in the country, but the most important cause of neglect was was uh, deliberate neglect in childhood, largely after the age of one or b below the age of five. It was could be breastfeeding, it could be early weaning, it could be better uh, better medical care for the girls, it could be better attention care actually. So what I'm saying is that but all this has become now overtaken by sex selection and this is what we are very worried about. Uh, fortunately, over the last 15 years, because of what's happening in China with respect to one child and what's in the census 2001, etc., th there's been global interest on this issue. There's been academic interest research in the country over the last few years. But of course now, when I look at our own general of gender studies in the country, less academics are now interested in the issue. So that is also a little concern. So. Uh, we have seen the rest of the world getting interested in this issue. We have seen uh, um, in many countries, in the last 10 years, people have looked at uh, Asian populations, Chinese, Indians, in many countries, UK, USA, uh, uh, Norway, Italy, Spain, everywhere they're finding Indians have less girls. So what you're seeing is not only the the practice in, within the subcontinent, but we are also seeing it in, in, in the Indian diaspora. In Europe, for instance, we, the French demographers have documented this in the caucus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. We have seen it ex expanding to Albania, Italians, and Italy, for instance, some of these nationalities are also having showing practices. So I think, so it's in that sense a global issue. And uh, uh, China has been relaxing one child over the last decade or so. So we would expect the Chinese numbers to come down very drastically over the last, uh, next decade. While the Indian numbers, my, my own perception is that things are getting much worse. Uh, we could come into this debate a little later. Let me just get into some of the individual states. If uh, so, 
sorry, uh, because it's online, please give me a little time. It's, it's huge amount of data, so the net may be also not that quick. Let me go to the largest state, Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh is a population of uh, several hundred million, bigger than Brazil. One in five girls are born in, today in this, in this state. And uh, let's see the practice there. Um, because we are worried about states like UP and Bihar, the biggest two states. One in three girls are born in these states. And uh, I'm really worried what will happen. Punjab Haryana about 2%. Kerala is about 2% of the country, but these are huge, one in three. And therefore, what happens in these states are really a uh, uh, concern. So if I look at, uh, again, 5%, you know, we can look at, you know, 10% also, but let me, for simplicity, just look at 5%, less than... So you see the expansion over the last next 10 years, from 2001 to 2011. Mm -hmm. And let's look at the urban, for instance. So you see even further expansion. So what I'm saying is that we can, you know, you, you can look at lower cutoffs. You can look at, uh, let me just, uh, some problem which I'm not able to see the... Uh, let me take a district uh, in uh, UP, or let's say Meerut, for instance. So we can go up to the village level, we can go up to the city level, uh, and then look at the changes. Uh, uh, So Meerut is important because this was a, it's just about 100 miles off Delhi. The British had started developing a city uh, after the first war of independence. And uh, in 1978, Meerut Medical College, Government Medical College in Meerut started doing sex determination because it was banned in Delhi. So, so from 78, last 40 years, people have been doing sexing here and you, you can see the impact in terms of ratios, already it became very bad. Let's see. So you see all around, like Taishan Sadhana is 850, not 8, this time is 844. So what I'm saying is that all, so we can even look at 10%, let's say, missing girls. So you see this, for instance, in Sardana, things have become much worse. So, you know, we can look at villages. Uh, so you can see again. So what we have is we have a tremendous amount of information on, on the country in terms of what is happening, but relatively very little sensitivity to do something about it. And that is, there is discourse. I, I'm, I'm not denying there is discourse in the country, but very little is happening to prevent it. Now, if you look at like 850, these are village level, individual villages in the Meerut district. So already if you look at by 2001, most of the villages became bad. So let's look at say something like 750, which will be one in four, I mean nearly one in four. Okay, so you see for instance, in certain areas, it has become, more villages have become 
that uh, less than 750 in 2011. So you can look at one in three. So what I'm trying to say is that maps show you patterns. Patterns are not going to be random. And that's why this is very useful. And uh, so what, I, what we are really looking at is very extreme forms of violence against women. Uh, last week I had gone on a government India inspection to some of these districts. In one district we were really uh, stopped by mobs because, uh, you know, the kind of sanction, and that's the difference, like sex selection is not seen as violence in large parts of North India. This is frightening. Uh, you know, I mean, I can walk into villages, I've done it in the last few years, in Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, in uh, Bihar, you know, people will tell you in the villages, yes, this person is doing sex selection, and uh, though it's illegal for so, so many years, 20 years, you see. So this is the problem. Like if you remember, more than two years ago, there was this rape in Delhi. There were young women and men, thousands of young men were, were protesting. So that was very encouraging because we see ma mass anger against violence against women. But we don't see that in this kind of violence, whether it's sex selection or other forms of violence. So that is indeed very worrisome. If you remember a few months ago, they, there was a big controversy in India because the government of India refused to allow the BBC film to be released. Okay? The government actually said, you know, we are worried and people will protest. Of course, they, they had other motives. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, a few months ago, the finance minister was uh, blaming the media, etc., saying that tourism in Delhi had fallen because of the high, high media highlighting this kind of, uh, by, uh, you know, response by young men and women. So, so the, the fact that sex selection is not a violence, is not perceived as violence, is very, very frightening. I can go to other states, I can go to Kerala, I can go to Kerala, we're dealing with half a person missing girls, not like 5% or 10% or more of what we are seeing. But half a person in Kerala is very frightening. Because for 100 years we've had the best ratios. We can look at Northeast, we can look at Orissa, we, all of these had very good ratios. Uttarakhand, which is the Himalayan state, we are seeing very, very worse, much worse situation than what we are seeing in UP. Himalayan regions, whether it's Himachal or Uttarakhand, were always very pro women, much better than the Gangetic plains, but there also we are seeing, you know, the, the promotion. Now, uh, what we are seeing is, uh, you know, relentless promotion by the doctors, by the medical professionals. For them, it's a huge income, uh, more than 1,000 crores, you know. And the more unethical a doctor is, the more money the doctors make. And that is something which is very difficult for people in the rest of the world to understand how could people be, professionals be so unethical. What we are frightened today is in terms of the rapid expansion of private medical education. People can buy degrees, pay money, and then do what they want to do. Now, in European history, if you look at uh, Foucault's uh, birth of a clinic, Foucault talked about 18th century uh, medical education where people were starting medical schools, etc. Now, that's all changed here, but in our country, it's expanding. In the parliament, in the Lok Sabha, which is the main people's chamber, of the 540 members, 100 members have private medical colleges. So that is frightening. The, 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 recently, the president of the World Medical Association was this Ketan Desai, who was, who was the head of the Medical Council of India. So there was a lot of protest few years ago when he was first elected in 2011. So they didn't allow him to take over because he was actually in jail for crap. which came out a few weeks ago, they claim things are improving. I'm not so sure. So, this is entirely based on, we have a sample registration system where about over a million families are prospectively followed for births and deaths. Because our birth registration system is not good, the government of India set up this system in, in the 70s to look at fertility trends. Now, this has become our primary source of uh, information on births. Because census only looks at surviving girls and so uh, what we they're claiming is indeed things are improving. I'm not so sure. No.
like this is the last 15 years trend of sample ratio uh, SRS trends. Now, in 2003-5, you see sudden improvement, but that's because the sample has changed. After every census, three, four years later, there's a change of sample. So that you are not actually a big rise. Now, let me show you here. These are the state-wise numbers uh, of sex ratio at birth. Now again, let me, I forgot to mention, in our country, India is the only country which looks which, where the sex ratios are by mm, females per thousand males. Everywhere in the world, it is number of uh, uh, men per thousand women. Because in the British came 150 years ago, when they started doing census, they found less women. They thought initially they were undercounting, but actually, you know, India and China are countries where women are less because of the violence in the society. Okay, so if you look at the, let's be hard, you see a steady improvement in sex ratio at birth, 870 to 911 over the last 15 years. <coughs> that's, that's essentially a problem of the survey uh, data. If you look at census, which is a better thing, actually we have shown a drop. If you look at, so what I'm saying is that, so we have to be very cautious when uh, imperfect data are used for uh, for uh, for making claims on things have improved. Delhi is the best example, like look, eight, 830s it started in early 2000 and it went up to 887, you know, sex ratio birth by the SRS. Now, the problem with SRS is it's a very small number of samples. Like in my state of Kerala, there are 5 lakh births every year. The sample of the estimate for Kerala is based on about less than 1,500 births. Okay, so therefore, you know, uh, it's difficult to, uh, to look at trends when the numbers are so small. But then it will give you an interesting example, like if you look at, uh, uh, this is the SRS data, which shows slight improvement over the years, which we believe it's true because we see that in this, uh, in other sources of data. If you look at sex, civil registration, Delhi seems to have a big, reasonably, Uh, Delhi seems to have a reasonably uh, good, in 2008, sex ratio birth of civil registration improved to 2004, which actually means, so there was a lot of joy in Delhi, there was, actually means 2004 means people of Delhi have started killing 5% of the boys. Uh, so what happened there was that, uh, you know, the uh, girl child scheme was started and therefore a lot of girls were re registered repeatedly. So you suddenly saw in 2008, a very sharp rise in, because the same girl was counted several times. So this imperfection, now if you look at 2009, 10, 11, 12, what you're seeing is a similar low 800, I mean high 800s is what you see. So why, so it's often we, you know, we play games with numbers, which is very frightening. There's always an effort to show data which is, you know, which looks much better than what it is. And uh, yesterday I was in uh, Copenhagen at the global school. So I was with Professor Siri. So Professor Siri was a representative of UNFPA China for many years. Uh, I met her in Beijing in 2004. So she was telling that at some point they didn't know what to believe because the government was manipulating the data. Now in, in our country it's not that gross, but at times, you know, we want to claim things are improving suddenly. You know, so this is one of our biggest problems. In that, in future, if people start playing with numbers, then and uh, making claims, we would really not know what's happening. And uh, methodologically, that's a very big problem because normally, when the initial stages of practice, like what we are seeing in Kerala in the initial years, there's a total denial by the medical establishment. There's any problem. By then, the practice becomes very clear. Now, for instance, Kerala. Uh, in the 60s or 80s, like when I went to Johns Hopkins in 81, Kerala was seen as a development model for the rest of the world. But, you know, we have enough of uh, a Kerala experts here to know what is the reality of Kerala in terms of women's status, women's uh, empowerment, so I don't have to get into that part. Uh, so, 
So denial is something what is the first reaction, like Kashmir Valley. For years they were denying it till, till we saw the 2009 stages where it was one of the sharpest drops in South, the sharpest drop in, in the last 50 years have occurred in Kashmir Valley. So this is something which we are really worried, that is uh, uh, to, to look good we might end up uh, In the long term, I'm very hopeful that these things will not, because there's no way uh, people will accept such severe shortage for a long time. But would that be in the next 20 years, 30 years, I don't know. Short term, it looks very distant. So even the most optimistic estimates are like little over 3 million girls being eliminated every year, which means 9 million medical kinds of determination and elimination. Uh, and one of the concerns we have on sex selection, and particularly, is in terms of the use of sex selection by. That we have loads of questions here. Can we open up the floor for sure. questions yeah, and you comments? Comments, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. <coughs> Thank you very much for this. I mean, quick question or comment. You said towards the end in, with hope that people will not accept it in the long term. Long term, yeah. But where does that hope come from? I mean, given that in long term also you have patriarchal values in various parts of India and it's getting worse, where is that hope coming from? And what do you see in India that okay. gives you now, hope? Let, let's look at the diaspora. Let me start with the diaspora, which is easier. Because the, 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 the feeling in some of the diaspora scholars is that probably with integration into the mainstream society, in the West, things will become better. I, I, that I leave it to you. Okay, now coming back to India. We have seen in Punjab Haryana with the worst ratios in, in, in 2001, we have seen improvements over the Punjab Haryana. Okay? Now, I am not so sure whether we will, are we seeing the low 700s as the worst? I am not so sure. But so far, we believe that when it reaches high 800s or low 700s, when, or high 700s, it will start improving. That's the feeling. But when it becomes extreme, you know, 700, 740, 750 means one in, literally one in four girls being eliminated. So, I mean, I, you know, what I'm saying is that, see, there's discourse, which is very important. Please remember in the 90s when I started working on this issue, you know, there was total denial in many, many parts of the country. Okay, there's practically no academic scholarship. The if you look at 91 census, 5% of the girls were already missing. You have a huge demographers' articles in Economic and Political Weekly and arguing that this is not real. Okay, so therefore, if you look at the academic literature, then, you know, like you had very big debates in the 80s and 90s in Economic and Political Weekly saying less women is good, that will raise the status of women in our country. So what I'm saying is that, so one shouldn't forget history, one shouldn't forget the debates. So in that sense, today it is less. So that, therefore, that is at least there is recognition things are happening. Whether people are doing enough, like one very hopeful thing which I forgot to mention, in the state of Maharashtra we are seeing improvements because more than 50 doctors have been convicted. Okay. So there, the medical associations are very angry because they see the rest of the country, doctors are making money in Maharashtra, they're not able to make money by eliminating goods. So the rates of determination have gone up by 10 times in Maharashtra. So that is a very substantive. But again, the rest of the country, we, we, we don't see the same commitment to implementation of the law. Like Kashmir, you're working in Kashmir, right? So if you look at, for instance, in the 9A, 91, we could not have a census in Kashmir because of the conflict. 2001 census was problematic because it was not done properly. So 2011, what we are seeing very sharp drops are because of, you know, lack of what happened in 2001. And now, you know, in the valley, for instance, the entire focus was saying that it is only in Jammu it is bad because Jammu is 800 in in 2001 and became 700 in 2011. Valley was 900 in 2001. It became 800 in 2011. So what I'm trying to say is this denial is frightening. In conflict, please remember, things are very different. Things are very different. 
in conflict societies, whether it's Manipur or Kashmir, people would not want to look at something like within the society. People are trying to always blame the outsiders for it. May I ask you, what do you see as the core reason to this? Yeah, I think that's uh, something which, uh, see, we, 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 as, you, as you've seen, we have had a society for which, had, which was there for various forms of discrimination for hundreds of years, probably much longer than that. But what we are seeing today, like in the last hundred years when overall women ratios are getting better, we are seeing such intense elimination in, at birth in the last 30, 40 years. So that, so whatever gains we are going to, what we have got in the last few decades will now definitely get lost because at source you are having such major numbers being detected. Okay, so now come, coming to what, see we, uh, like if you look at private medical education, mm -hmm. like for years Kerala would refuse to have private medical colleges, but in the last decade we have seen the private medical colleges started in Kerala. Today we have the largest number of, in the last few years, largest number of private medical colleges per population in Kerala. And so we are very worried that with this expansion that you will have practices like sex selection. So, so what I'm saying is that so the absolute lack of regulation of private medical education, the kinds of conflicts we are seeing in our society, you know, like for instance, let me just, oh, I, I, I could have shown you Hindu-Muslim data because 2001 census for the first time we had uh, ratios by religion. 2011 it was ready last year but the government of India did not release it. Just before the Bihar election they released the overall population, they didn't release the child sex ratios. So what I'm saying is that when you look at a state like UP. Uh, you do find the ratios are very bad in huge number of districts among Hindus. Muslims are a little better. But remember again, no community is, what, what we are seeing is prosperity tends to be very anti-girl. The richest communities in the country, Sikhs and Jains. Now Sikhs is the most liberal religion in terms of, uh, you know, but we see the Sikhs and Jains have the worst ratios, you see. Jains are very, very, uh, uh, very strong <coughs> tenets on non-violence, they don't kill flies, they don't eat anything which grows under the ground, mm -hmm. but they don't seem to have any problem of eliminating the girls, you see. Mm -hmm. so, so what I'm saying is that this kind of contradiction uh, is something, and plus, you know, like for instance, you, you, if you look at China in the 80s, because South Korea in the 80s, the same ultrasound companies like GE, which started selling ultrasound for determination of sex, when they started manufacturing in India, they said they will not do it, but they did exactly the same. So what I'm saying is that so you have, you know, uh, so we had to go to the court against these companies and uh, so then the companies were told that they can only sell it to clinics who were registered. So when that became the norm, we saw actually sales in ultrasound coming down. So what I'm trying to say, because by late 90s, sexing became the most common use of ultrasound. So therefore, you know, the, in the last few years we've had major battles with with Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, because print advertisements, okay? I got interested in sex selection in, in the law because when I went to Punjab in 98, I saw advertisements in newspapers for sex selection. Okay, so we went to the court against that. So we were able to buy 2001, we were able to, like Times of India had major advertisements on sex selection. So we were able to get all that stock, but then it moved to the internet. So we have been in the court since 2008, Last month, for instance, Google Shopping dropped all the advertisements on sex selection products first time, you know. After many, many months after, because these big companies don't believe that they have to follow Indian law. So what I'm saying is that if you look at Google, Google's own backyard in Mountain View, in the Santa Clara County, where a lot of Asians are there, because of very extensive advertisements in, in the Google there, we've seen South Asian communities, Vietnamese, Chinese, Indians, all their girls are coming down. Now, it's a very interesting paradox in Google. It is a company which is based, which is a very significant Asian men population. You know? The workers are very significantly Asian men, but they don't seem to have a problem with their company doing sex selection. And Google is not like an ordinary American company in the sense they're very, very pro abortion But they feel that sex selection is good because it's good technology, okay? Uh, it's new technology, like the Yahoo chief has an investment in a big sex selection product, you know, because they see it as a good. 
So, so what I'm saying is that so we, we are seeing new techniques and methods being promoted even before they're proven to be effective on the net. So creating new markets, which is frightening. Because now ultrasound, we can determine if you have very sophisticated missions by 12 weeks, you, now you have blood tests, which you can determine by the first seven, eight weeks. So new technologies can change even further this form. I think that you can prohibit sex selective abortion. It's already prohibited. You can attack technology, and you can. Um, what else can you do? You can prohibit uh, private clinics, etc. It will not help. I think you have to change people's um, mentality. You have to yeah, attack patriarchy. I think it's it's. Again, as I said, like for instance, 30 years ago when I started working in villages, we are dealing with infanticide, we are dealing with neglect. Infanticide is very rare, but there was still ability to make differences in that, in those. But the way of sex selection is spreading, and I think that is something which, you know, like last week I was in Western UK for a government of India inspection. You know, some of these places, the, the interests doing sex selection are so formidable, they wouldn't even allow us to visit clinics. You would have lawyers, you would have doctors coming in mobs just to prevent. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, like Bijnor. Bijnor was where we have seen recorded evidence in articles in 1984 in Economic and Political Weekly, Social Science and Medicine, talking about Bijnor, which is a remote corner in, in Western UP. So today, because section has gone on for 30 years there, the constituency which you're talking about, which, which is there to promote these merchants who are promoting sex selection. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctors are doing it every day because it's good money. You, the health workers, the nutrition workers are all part of it because their wages are small, but th this is a very good. So when you ch talk about changing mindsets, you should also see what, what technology does to change culture. Like in terms of small families, people are now laugh laughing at pe families who have two to three girls. Uh, that I think is very impo in interesting, important. I'm not saying that so we should, when you talk about changing mindsets, we should also see how other, other things happening around us change also mindsets. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, with mindset, I don't mean the mindset about uh, sex selective abortion. I mean the mindset about the status of women. So not specifically about abortion and, and sun preference, but, but about sun preference. Why do people want sons? You have to change the inheritance system. You have to change, so I, 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 I increase agree. the status of women. And if I may, before I let uh, Monica in, I would just quote, uh, give you a quotation, if I may, from a census of Travancore in 1921. And in Travancore, which was part of Kerala, um, they had uh, an inheritance system which was on the female side, on the female line. And um, in the census uh, 1921, it said, it will be seen that female infanticide and neglect of females are unthinkable in a country where the law of inheritance is through females along the majority of the population. The evil effects of early marriage and premature childbearing and of high birth rate, etc., uh, are out of the question. Under the Marumakatayam law, which was the law in, in uh, uh, the, that part of the country of India at that time, for, uh, uh, under the Marumakatayam law of inheritance, followed by the majority of the people, female lives are more valued than male ones. And then this, I think Kerala is such a nice and um, illustrating example of how it has changed because then people wanted to have daughters. And even in certain communities in Kerala today, it's still more important to have a daughter than to have a son because still in certain areas, the inheritance goes through the females. Even if it is prohibited by law now, the female, uh, the, this <coughs> system, um, they can avoid it in some, some parts of the country, especially in the Muslims there by certain, in certain, certain ways. So for every man in Kerala at that time, or Travancore, it was important to have a sister because her children would be the ones he was responsible for. And then when it has changed in Kerala, we can see it so, I can't show you because I, my, um, I'm, not, I'm not able to uh, attach this computer to, to, to the <laughs> technology here, I think. But you can see how it has changed in Kerala, um, the um, number of uh, girls per a thousand boys from 1950s and up to it is uh, uh, decrease. Yeah. Less and less girls, and 
they have now more and more the same uh, inheritance system as in the rest of Kerala. So I think that is what you have to attack, the, the no, I, I, power I, I, of I, women. I don't deny it. Mm. But in the context of a genocide, what do we do? Mm. It's, that's very important. It's millions and millions being eliminated. Mm. It's not uh, one or two. So therefore, that is the, which, like for instance, in the last 40, 50 years, since independence, we have seen women's education improve, North India, South India, several times. But now with the very high risk of insecurity with women when they want to step out of her house for education or for employment, there's very, very high uh, in degree of insecurity in, in these communities. We are dealing with 700, 800 sex ratios. So those progress which we think will happen may not be happening that way. Yeah, you were saying that um, sex uh, selection is not taught or not perceived as violence against women. Yeah. Uh, and today the issue is so big in India, violence against women, and yeah. you know the new movement is nearly happening. How would you say? Um, how would it be possible to to actually in, get the discussion about sex? selection into the discourse of violence against women. And would that help to... See, like by 80s, by 85, for instance, in Maharashtra, the women's movement had acknowledged that sex selection was violence. Mm -hmm. Because in the West, particularly if you look at the American feminist literature, sex selection was seen as a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so though, and that's why in Maharashtra we had the first law in 1988, and then it became, national law became in 94. So therefore the ideology was right. But somehow we didn't work towards spreading it. See, it, the clinics spread far quickly, much more quickly. The, the kind of promotion of sex selection was, you know, hundred times more vigorous than any kind of uh, any kind of uh, you know promoting the value of the girl child. So therefore, we failed it at that time, and today our challenges are much more because you know the people who earn eliminating girls have tremendous influence over. And that is frightening. And remember, please, now we have we are moving right wing. You know, in terms of our politics is becoming more right wing. And therefore, like for instance, you have the quotes which are saying in terms of dowry deaths that women are I mean women are misusing the law. Like we have a special law 498A in the Indian Criminal Code which makes it you know which presumes that if a murder if a death has occurred, it is a uh, dowry related death and therefore it's on the part of the guilty to prove that they are innocent. Okay? So now the new government is also willing to dilute that. So therefore we please remember our politics is also becoming very not so favorable in terms of women. And that is frightening. Okay? So we we may have had, you know, you know, like at the state level or at the national level, unlike the Western unlike Europe or US, we have had women who have been in very significant positions of power, but unfortunately, they have not made this as a... So, yes, sorry. Oh, yeah, I, I go just, ahead, go ahead, please. I, like, I really agree that it is about changing the mentality within Indian culture towards women. And I, I'm really concerned that the diaspora who have come to a more progressive culture in terms of the treatment of women are still ta carrying on this practice. I just want to hear more either from your friends or from yourself, from yourself about that because that's, that's really concerning that here in Sweden or in Britain or in Europe that they're continuing that practice. I, I, let me tell you, see, I, I, I'm a little worried because like for instance, look, look at Canada for instance. They had a very, very progressive movement in the 90s by the Indian community. There were certain elements who were very, very promoting the idea of equality coming out very strongly against sex selection, etc. Now, but we also have, you know, see, like you, you would see this in the West, you know, like for instance, among the immigrant communities, they tend to pretend they're whites and they tend to be more white than the uh, the white society. For instance, in, like in Canada, we recently had a problem that we had one of the prominent researchers, you know, wanting to uh, make abortion. Uh, more difficult for women wanting the sex to be revealed for before the abortion is, and when the abortion is done. Now, which is all very anti-women in terms of and which and this is a very prominent Canadian researcher of Indian origin because he was trying to uh, be favorable to the 
the white establishment to get. So what I'm trying to say is that, so you have that face also, you see, where people in the community, you know, who want to deny. But what is interesting is both in the US, UK, we have been having, you know, new feminism of color, which is very, very good, which is very significant, where they see sex selection and sex selective abortion both as discriminatory against women, because the traditional uh, Western view is that that abortion rights are supreme. And there's nothing beyond, uh, you know, that is just like the Pope and the Catholic Church is so anti-abortion. Any like all the 99% of the cardinals who were who were appointed by Pope Paul John VI were anti-abortion. So they changed the entire church, like the entire American hierarchy of the Catholic Church, which was pro-abortion, was removed completely. So like that, you know, in there are feminist circles where abortion rights are the ultimate, you know. Like so, those things, you know, in the context of discrimination, I think one has to look at one has to look at not just abortion per se. What is discriminatory? If if it's sex selection is discriminatory, is unacceptable. Yeah. 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 I can tell you about why the society in Scandinavia do that and because we are like now we are third generation already in Scandinavia. Like my parents, they came here like 45 years back. They have this old culture. They still have this thought that they want to have a son. And uh, we're supposed to be like seven girls. We are only four. They 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 they, they meet the children till they get their own son it was very important even we were living in Scandinavia um, uh, I remember my uh, my friend who was born in Scandinavia this is the second generation and she got now she got the four daughters but still the family they lost their daughters but still the family back home you know, the auntie and uncles and grandparents, they say, yeah, maybe you have a better luck next time. So they're still making the children, they're still making like, try to make the son, they have already four girls, they're gonna have the fifth one, and they hope they will get the son, because to please the family back home, because auntie, uncles, grand grandparents want to see their grandson. I think uh, the, the mentality is still, uh, it's, it still has status to have a son. You move to America, you move to Scandinavia, you get a status because you move to a, a country, you become a rich, but they still have a mentality, you, you are not rich before you get a son. They still have this mentality. It's very bad. And the that? other thing, okay. uh, the other thing, uh, I have uh, the two uh, in Swedish. I have uh, two articles. Uh, many families, also Pakistanis, Indians, Turkians, uh, in Norway, for for some some year back, uh, the doctor, the staff, to tell you about the the, the gender of the child, because. Uh, they were thinking why why the immigrants are taking more abortions than the Scandinavian. So then they started to research about it. So they found out because because they, they saw the sex of the child and did it because of the girls. So 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 in a way the doctor they don't tell the gender of the child anymore. Then they started to go to to Sweden. Then they start to send their, uh, you know, the wives to London, to Sweden, to do it, because you know we don't need it. They don't tell the sex of the child anymore. And uh, when when the, the girls are pregnant, they send them back home to check it. Even we have enough money. Even we are rich enough. Our doctors in Scandinavia. They have their future. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, they don't get the education. They don't have the money. We are not poor. We live here. 
I think it's the change, like you just told, that we need to change the attitude. We need to change our thoughts. So, I think just confirming that and going back to what you talked of, very important point of how prosperity has been anti-women in Indian context where more rich you are, a much rich area generally tend to practice sex selective abortion, yeah. partly because they can afford to, that's also yes. fact. And poor areas may not practice sex, sex selective abortion, but they might practice infanticide more because they might not afford abortion. Yes. Going back to the, you know, I think the whole idea of Asian family values, for instance, which exists in UK, mm -hmm. where the conservative right always talks of we should, so we would always imply white. But it should learn from family values of Asians. And it would also be a very racialized notion or racist notion against black families. So black people and white people would be seen as not having true family values compared to the Asians. The point is that family value itself is deeply patriarchal. And laws are important, no doubt. Punishment is important. But in the end, it's a fundamental challenge that everyone including within the family, has to tackle. So for instance, if in our family this happens, rather than keeping quiet, we have yes. to challenge our own father, our own mother, our own brother, our own sister, or ourselves. So I do think therefore it's a struggle which is not only about law, not only about political, but something that has to be waged in every household. Without that, I don't think it's going to change. Yeah, but remember, see what you've seen in over 300 years, what we are seeing in 50 years, changes in 50 years in the continent, you know, subcontinent. So, and in those 50 years, technology has made the difference, you see. So therefore, traditional forms of neglect are easier to deal with. Mm. Traditional forms, infanticide, you know, because for, for 10 years I was dealing with malnutrition and infanticide. It's much easier to deal with than sex selection. Mm. Though, in the West, there's a perception that infanticide is more brutal than sex selection. Mm. But in reality, Given the kind of uh, organized support for sex selection we have, you know. And to change people's mentality, it's not that easy. Yeah. It's not done very, very quickly. I don't know about those of you who are born in uh, Sweden. Did you ever feel that you had to have a brother? That your brother had more um, uh, status than yourself? No? Mm. You did? Yeah. Well, I've heard from, from relatives, actually. Yeah. Uh, are you okay? You don't have any brothers. Who's taking care of you? So I think uh -huh. that still exists. And it still exists. Yeah. Yeah. No, but the, the point here is that, you know, like, you know, there's no conscious elimination of a girl. No, absolutely. So that, that is course. very different. Of course it is. You know, because mm -hmm. that, you know, like, it may be after three girls, so, you know, people want a boy. But if you look at the Indian demography or the South Asian one, it's very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, except for Japan. Now, yesterday I was told there's some evidence that there is a Japanese society is now starting preferring girls. Now, I haven't, s but last hundred years, all the other Asian societies, whether it's Taiwanese, Chinese, uh, South Korean, everywhere we have seen Singapore, we have seen masculinizations of sex ratios at birth, mm -hmm. except Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm told that Japan probably will now show some preference for girls, we are not sure, but. And uh, like you also were telling, it's uh, in Helen, the color of the lens there. In Arvin, the third day. Inheritance. Yeah, inheritance. Inheritance, yes. Mm. Uh, I remember, uh, I can talk about myself, and uh, uh, our father is quite rich back home because he forced us to work a lot. We were working, all the children were working a lot, and he was investing all the money back. Home in India, and he's, he became a millionaire. I mean, he's a he's very rich man back in India. But he got his son after making so many useless doctors, like he said. He got his son. So now uh, his son was very clever because he wanted all the children to get married. Because our parents, we are all, all the children are arranged married. And his son said, our little brother, you can't make me because I'm born here. You can't make me to, to marry anybody you want. And our father said, of course I can meet you. You won't inherit anything of my properties. 
So he was very clever. Abhimanyu was very clever. He said, okay, if you want that, I want to inherit everything you have. You girls will not get anything. In Scandinavia, you cannot do that. But in back home, you can do that. So he is going to have every, all the properties back in India because he made them. He, they made the papers. But in Scandinavia, you can do that. So we girls, we don't get anything mm -hmm. back home. Anything of, I think that mm -hmm. also, uh, it's also the, the status uh, of the girls. Like you also told, it's very important. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, we have the organization like in India, they we helping the poor children for study and the girls for the, their education. So we started to build the home in uh, Maharashtra. So we started to build a small homes for the families. Then we got a new problem because then they have the house, little small houses. Then uh, the, the men, they started to divorce their women because they didn't get the son. So after two sons, no, after two daughters, three daughters. So then we, uh, then they kick their, their, their wives out of the house. So we get a new problem. So then, uh, 15 years back, then I say, all the house, they should be, you know, owned by women in the house. So when we, when we build the small houses for them, you know, with it, so the women, and the, they own the house. So then they got much more respect because they, the, they had the house. Even they have a two, three daughters, but they own the house. And then we gave the status to the women. Women have a much higher status. So I think, uh, like you said, all, we need to empower the women by education, by that they can own their own houses. Yeah, by um, a new inheritance system, by new laws. Yeah, improving yeah. the law. But, but I don't know what about the law in India. I, I don't know because. I know about uh, what happened in my family that our brother is going to do mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. This thing do that in India. Uh, you can See, like in Goa, for instance, uh, Portuguese inheritance was equal, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. yes. But even there you have these things, you see, because the dominant culture mm -hmm. makes uh, the dominant practices, mm -hmm. you know, change a lot. Like mm -hmm. uh, what we are seeing in the Nile society, which practice essentially you know, the have become very long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's one part of it is it can